to the CITCO Harvesting and Post-Harvest Handling of Grain webinar. My name is Wendy Mazura. I'm the Head of Agronomy Services at CITCO. Joining me for the presentation is Dr. Mabuyai, a renowned maize breeder, not just in Zimbabwe, but in Africa. So for the presentation layout, we are going to start by giving you some housekeeping issues. We are going to be recording the presentation for the purposes of internal use. The presentation is going to run for 45 minutes. A PowerPoint presentation will be beamed on the screen during the course of the presentation for your benefit and better understanding. Typed questions are invited and answers will be provided during the course of the presentation. Once the presentation is done, notes will be provided and you'll be able to look back and see the video as it is going to be shared on a different platforms. For the layout of the presentation, we are going to start off by looking at the importance of harvesting and post-harvest handling of grain. Then we'll move on to look at harvesting and harvesting preparations, harvesting time, moisture and harvesting, harvesting methods, as well as the grain drying methods before we look at how we can best protect our grain from damage and post-harvest losses. Just looking at Zimbabwe at a glance, 60 to 70% of Zimbabwe's population is dependent on agriculture for livelihoods. And we have seen that the industries are supplied by 60% of the raw materials that go into the industry are supplied by agriculture. It is also important for us to note that agriculture is the one that gives us our staple food. Our staple food is maize and it's a grain crop and we also find that our second most important grain crop is wheat. So it's important for us to make sure that we optimize grain harvesting and preserve our grain as much as possible to avoid incurring losses. Did you know that post-harvest losses can range between 20 to 30% in storage? An additional 10 to 20% is incurred during field transportation and processing which is to say this is too much of a loss to incur at the last minute after you have established your crop successfully and you were looking forward to getting a bumper harvest. It is crucial for us to minimize losses as much as possible for us to remain viable in our farming enterprises. Now, it is said that failing to plan is as good as planning to fail. So it's important for you to start and plan ahead of the harvest. Make sure that if you're going to be using machinery, it is well serviced and the adjustments that need to be made have been made well in advance of the harvesting period. This will make sure that the breakdowns that might occur during the harvesting period are brought to a minimum and you'll be able to finish in the desired time. Prepare equipment, set it, calibrate it. If you're going to be harvesting using different materials, make sure that it's in place well before harvesting. If you're going to be purchasing sex that you're going to be using, make sure that you do that as well, well before the harvesting period commences. Drying facilities should be in place and ready. They should be cleaned, but I'm not going to go into detail as Dr. Mabuyaya is going to give us a detailed explanation of what we should do in times of storage. The time of planting. Time of planting, time of harvesting plays a pivotal role in that we need to make sure that we adhere to the days that are stipulated for the different varieties. These differ, however, according to the altitude of the area and the heat units that are experienced. Where we find that the seed product basket, wide as it is, from the ultra early maturing variety, which matures in 90 to 115 days, to the very early 115 to 127 days, early 127 to 137 days, and the, the gurus of the yield, the medium maturing variety, which matures in 137 to 149 days, and the highest yielding maize varieties in the 700 series, not only in Zimbabwe, but in Africa, it's, which mature in the period between 150 to 160 days. It's important for you to take note of this, but bear in mind that it will vary from region to region, depending on the altitude, and the region that, uh, is, that you are uh, establishing your crop in. 
The other thing that we take note of during the time of harvesting is senescence or aging, where we are saying that your crop naturally, when it reaches maturity, it's going to start changing color, turning yellow, turning brown, with the leaves dying down. However, be careful not to mistake aging for senescence with the aging that occurs because of the occurrence of diseases or other problems that might be in the fields. It's important to match this senescence process with the days to maturity of a particular variety. The most pivotal and most important thing to take note of at harvesting is the physiological maturity. What do we mean by this? We mean that at this stage, the crop ceases to grow. The crop ceases to accumulate any weight and grain filling stocks. So at this stage, it is to say you need to start preparing for harvesting. However, it differs from crop to crop, the signs that you're going to be seeing. For maize, you see the formation of a black layer at the tip of the kernel. And for soya bean, the pods start turning, their color starts turning to take the form of a mature pod. For, soya, for sorghum and millet, there is the formation of the black uh, layer as well, just like uh, what happens in the maize. However, it's important for you to note that at this stage, it's not the ideal stage for you to, to start harvesting your crop as the moisture content might be too high for you to harvest and store your grain. On moisture content, I'll hand you over to Dr. Mabuyai, who is going to discuss more on that topic. Uh, once again, uh, good morning. I'm going to take you through moisture uh, and uh, harvesting. Uh, there are two things um, that moisture uh, plays in so far as grain economics is concerned. Uh, it, it's either it's too wet uh, or it's, it's, it's too dry. Uh, when it's too wet, you, you get the risk of deterioration and spoilage. Uh, when it's too dry, uh, you lose uh, on weight. Um, you also invite uh, insect pests uh, that also thrive uh, in, in too dry grain. So there are specifics for each crop uh, that farmers or whoever is handling grain uh, need to be aware of in terms of the maximum uh, thresholds for grain that has to be stored. Uh, we are looking at maize generally about 12.5%, uh, soya beans it's 11%, uh, sorghum and other millets 12.5%, um, uh, groundnuts around 7%. What these uh, moisture thresholds um, mean is at these uh, moisture contents, you are not going to encourage uh, rapid deterioration uh, of your grain uh, when you keep it, or whether for long term uh, or short term. Uh, you are not going to encourage uh, fungal development as you uh, find later on when we go to how uh, these things affect uh, other issues like uh, human health. So the, 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 the thing that moisture affects in, 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 in grain is um, related to fungal and insect problems, uh, respiration uh, and, the, and the germination. If the moisture is too high um, and you try to store the grain, 
uh, you encourage the growth of uh, fungal and the as a result the fungi uh, develop uh, uh, mycotoxins uh, such as aflatoxin and we as we all know uh, aflatoxins are carcinogenic um, and the cancer is a disease uh, that has resulted in loss of many lives now uh, stored grain uh, with high moisture content also increases the rates of respiration uh, remember the seed or grain um, is a living thing so if the moisture content is too high it affects the respiration some of it may begin to to germinate uh, in the process uh, it results in heat build up uh, humidity also uh, goes up and once the temperature and humidity go up again uh, promote the development of insects and the uh, fungi. This sort of results in a vicious cycle uh, where uh, one event uh, leads to um, another event and not only in a simple way but maybe in a geometric uh, pattern and it becomes a vicious cycle so that the farmers will find it very difficult to uh, get the maximum out of the grain that they would have uh, stored. Uh, over to you, Wendy. Thank you very much, Doc, for that uh, detailed explanation of the importance of moisture in grain. You have heard it from yourself, for yourselves from the expert that moisture is very, very detrimental in grain and uh, in grain storage and post harvest handling. Now, moving on to the harvesting methods, st starting off with the hand harvesting. There are different ways in which grain can be harvested. However, we have highlighted just three for the purposes of this presentation. The first one is the bang board trailer. In this one, it is usually used by those farmers who do not have access to combine harvesters, but they have a tractor and a trailer. This method of harvesting involves a gang of people who are going to go into the field for the purposes of harvesting on either sides of the trailer. During the process of harvesting, they are going to be taking the cobs from the plants and throwing them into the trailer. The important thing to note is that uh, you should avoid having gangs that are too large on either side of the trailer, as there is a risk of them throwing the cobs on the ground and missing the trailer. So it's important for you to minimize losses in the field and avoid double handling of grain in the field as well, so that you don't incur unnecessary losses. The other method is the use of drums and sacks and a trailer. In this method, some farmers might find it easier for them to harvest their cobs and throw them into the sack or into the, into the drum, and then it is loaded into one trailer for a central point where it is going to be offloaded. The other method that is used is also the use of uh, sacks and bags, whereby you're just throwing in your grain. In the drums and sack method with the trailer, some farmers might even have a shaler mounted as well to the tractor so that once you have harvested and loaded onto the, onto the shaler, the grain is shelled and you are avoiding the risk or the need for you to reuse, to rehandle that grain again once it has been shelled, bagged, and then it awaits storage. Hand harvesting for soya bean and small grains. This usually on a small scale is done using a gang of people who go in and cut off the plant at the base, or if it's for small grains, they cut off at the head. For further processing at the sheds or at the storage facility where, there is, where the intention to store the grain is. Moving on to more sophisticated methods of harvesting. These are usually used by farmers who are growing crops on a large scale, the use of a combine harvester. This is a tool of precision in that it does different operations at one go. It is able to harvest the crop, to dehusk, to winnow, and it's also able to measure the moisture content depending on the model of the harvester that you will be using. The important thing when using harvesters is to make sure that you do the necessary checks before you go into the field. 
make sure the harvester matches the interval spacing that you used during the establishment of your crop to avoid having some lines being straddled on by the harvester and you having to come back again to handle that grain. So it's important for you to also make sure that when using harvesters, they are well serviced. If you're going to hire, make sure that you are hiring from reputable suppliers to avoid unnecessary breakdowns that might affect the turnover of your time and your harvesting in the field. Now moving on to drying methods. It is necessary for you to come in with drying methods. Like doctor was explaining that sometimes the grain might have very high moisture. So there might be need for you to come in with methods to further dry the grain before you store it. There are two main methods of drying, natural drying and artificial drying. Under natural drying, we are trying as much as possible to use the natural environment, the sun and the air, to make sure that there is a lot of movement of the air between the grain and allow for the drying process to continue. Some farmers might do this by leaving the cobs in the fields. However, there are high risks of theft during this period. So some farmers might harvest and put the grain at a centralized point. For example, the storage structure, which is called a crib or a thara in Shona. Some farmers might even spread the grain over a hard surface or a rock surface. The important thing is to make sure that there is no direct contact of the grain and the ground because moisture may accumulate and result in the deterioration of the quality of the grain. It's also important to make sure that you maximize the, the airflow between the grain to avoid uh, laying thick layers of, of seed together as this will delay the drying process. The artificial process of drying is mostly used by commercial farmers in that they introduce heat into the grain, which forces the moisture to evaporate. This method differs depending on the, on the grain that is being handled, but the principle is to allow for maximum drying of the grain as possible. In this method, commercial farmers might have the need or the desire to come in with another crop, so this works and comes in handy. Just to give you some examples of the drying methods that are there, there is the traditional drying structure that we were referring to, the dara in Shona, or the, the crib. As you can see, it's on a raised platform to avoid direct contact with the ground, and all sides are open to allow for free flow of air. The second structure is artificial grain drying structure, and the third structure is a more modernized version of the grain structure, which was taken from one of our key farmers in Mangura. So this can be done by every farmer. What's important is for you to make sure that you are drying your grain to the desired moisture content. On that note, I'll hand you over to Dr. Mabuyai to discuss on protecting the harvest. Three basic uh, steps that we, we need to be aware of. Uh, one is the sanitation, two is the uh, control or treatment, and three is regular uh, inspections. We need to make sure that the storage place uh, is clean. Uh, we have sprayed it. Uh, in case of the dara that we're talking about, if there are any cracks there, uh, we need to make sure that we have taken uh, care of that. And the grain that we are putting there, we need to make sure that it is clean. Uh, when it comes to control, uh, some of the grain, when it comes from the field, it may already have some. Um, uh, insect infestation, uh, there may already be some weevils there. So we need to make sure that we have applied uh, the grain um, uh, protectant so that we don't take a problem from the field uh, to the storage place. Uh, there are lots of uh, grain protectants, shumba, acteric super, uh, that farmers or those who store grain uh, can use. Uh, when we are storing grain, what do we need to remember is uh, deterioration may happen when the um, moisture is too high, uh, the grain is diseased. Uh, and normally when these um, are in place, uh, we, we, we can encourage insects to multiply. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, rodents 
uh, do not gain access to uh, the, the, the grain. Uh, we need also to make sure that the temperature uh, in which we are storing the grain is the right temperature. Uh, insects you know, normally thrive very well when the temperatures are around between 28 uh, and 35 uh, degrees. And fungal pathogens uh, thrive very well when the humidity uh, is between 60 and 80. So whatever our storage conditions that we have, they have to take that into consideration to make sure that our temperatures are as low as possible. Our humidity is, is lower than uh, the 60 to 80 as much as possible so that we don't encourage the proliferation uh, of uh, um, either fungal pathogens uh, and uh, insects. Next. So having said that, we need to make sure that our facilities are thoroughly cleaned. Uh, all the debris that may be in the storage facility is taken out. Uh, we thoroughly screen. Uh, we mix the grain with the protectant, the spermiphos, the spermithrin. Uh, whilst we are doing this, we also need to make sure that we observe uh, the safety uh, precautions when we are applying these uh, chemicals. And when we take out the, the grain, uh, be it for sale, be it for consumption, we need to make sure that uh, the safety precautions that are on the labels are observed. And we need to apply the first in, first out uh, principle so that older grain comes out first and the newer grain uh, comes out last. Thank you very much, Doc, for that. So it's important for you to observe the FIFO concept. First in, first out, so that you do not mix old grain with new grain. Moving on to grain storage. Grain can be stored in two main forms, as bulk or as bag. Storage facilities must be suited for the method of storage that needs to be used. There needs to be the necessary equipment and the necessary material to use for the different method of storage that you want to use for your particular farm. So, so begging, begging requires labor, labor. Oh, in or some in some instances, for large, for large production, production, you might, you might even, even need a conveyor belt for you, for to, you to load the bag into, into a truck, truck maybe for, for delivery or for further storage. Bulk storage requires loading into bulk trailers or bins. Sometimes, Sometimes you might even need to use an auger. So it's important for you to check, take note of this if you're going to be using either one of the methods of storage. Bulk storage versus bag storage particularly looking at large-scale grain production. We see that it's more economic to use bulk storage than bag storage in that there is less supervision and labor during the use of bulk storage than bag storage, and also there is less handling of the grain. The bulk storage is more hygienic than the bag storage, but however, there are pros and cons for either, either one, one of the storage methods. methods. With bag storage, if done adequately and properly, works efficiently and it brings out the desired results. It's important for you to weigh the pros and cons of either and the resources that you have so that you take the best method that works for you. On bulk storage, these are the checks and balances that you need to embark on before or during the process for it to be successful. The structure must, not, must allow for loading and offloading of grain, which is to say, you should have a point where you are loading and you are offloading the grain to avoid mixing of old and new grain. The structure must also be weatherproof, which is to say you need during your preparation stage to make sure that there are no leaks, there are no crevices, there are no worn out places that might be uh, harboring points for insects or particular moisture points. So it's important for you to take note of that. The structure must allow for inspection, fumigation and cleaning on a regular basis. The grain must be dry to a moisture content for maize, especially less than 12.5%. Only store dry grain and constantly check the temperature and humidity as well. Manage all insects before you store the grain and make sure that you are storing clean grain to maintain the quality for future use. 
So this is just an example of the different grain storage structures that you might find with the most popular one, the GMB silos, taking in a large volumes of grain for storage, followed by the rural granary, commonly known as the Lura. As you can see, these farmers, they know the importance of avoiding direct contact of the ground and the grain, as this structure has been created on a raised platform of rock pebbles. And you're also seeing that below it, there's a metal silo. Moving with technology, it's important for us to advance. So this is also possible to use as it has a hermetic seal, which avoids the entry of air inside and also makes the structure airtight for better storage of your grain for longer term use. And we're also seeing now the last picture on the last picture where you're seeing the bagged maize in a granary. Yes, you can see it's neatly packed for easy inspection, for easy handling, and it's also showing that the grain is not placed directly onto the ground. It's on raised platforms. In this particular case, it's on pellets. So it's important for you to also take note of that. Having said that, I'll hand you over to Dr. Mabuyai to give us a summary of the presentation. Summarily, what we are saying is uh, pre and post haven grain losses account for up to 40% uh, of grain losses in Zimbabwe. Uh, take, it, uh, take it this way, that if you harvest 10 tons per hectare uh, and 40% of that uh, can be lost uh, due to these losses that we have alluded to, uh, that's a lot. Uh, we cannot afford to lose uh, the the whole uh, forty percent of that of that yield uh, for something that we uh, that we can uh, prevent. Uh, we have seen that uh, pre-harvest checks are important uh, to make sure machinery is ready, to make sure there are calibrations, so that we minimize. Uh, uh, these uh, losses that result in 40 percent. Uh, we have to make sure that the drying facilities and the storage facilities are ready and the, will not encourage uh, the development uh, of um, fungi, development of um, um, pests that will result and contribute to uh, this 40 percent. We have also said uh, different corps have different physiological maturity indicators, and the uh, farmers should be aware of this. Um, this helps in the greater uh, planning uh, to make sure that everything flows uh, from harvesting to the storage facilities. Uh, moisture, we have seen the critical role uh, that moisture plays in its fungal, in its fires, the fungal buildup is concerned uh, in as far as uh, the proliferation of aflatoxins uh, is concerned. We all know the dangers that come with the with cancer. Uh, moisture is, is, is a rate determining factor uh, in the vicious cycle involving respiration, temperature, humidity, and insect population uh, buildup. And these uh, factors are key uh, in the 40% grain losses that we experience uh, every year. Um, our harvesting, of course, it can be done by hand, uh, it can be done by, by machine, depending on the, um, the level of farming or the scale uh, that is around a particular place. Uh, drying can be natural, drying can be artificial, uh, again, depending on land use facilities, on land use that uh, um, a farmer will have chosen, depending on the environment, uh, depending on the facilities and the scale. Uh, we need to make sure that we protect uh, the whole season sweat, we protect the harvest. The grain must be uh, kept at recommended uh, moisture levels. Uh, we have alluded to the different uh, moisture content levels that each and every particular uh, crop, uh, in terms of the minimum um, uh, or the maximum thresholds, 
the grain must be kept at uniform temperatures lower than that which promotes insect growth and humidity buildup. Uh, grain must be protected from insect attack, uh, keep out the rodents and beds. Uh, thank you. Over to you, Wendy. Thank you very much, Doc, for that detailed summary of the importance of handling grain properly. Because as you have rightfully heard from the doctor, it's important for you to make sure that you do not lose your yield at the last minute. Harvesting and post-harvest handling of grain is very, very important. important. At this, at stage, this stage, we are we going, are going to, entertain to entertain questions from the, from, from the participants so that we can be interactive in our presentation. One of the questions that came through was asking about the contribution of the agricultural sector to the GDP. And I'll ask Dr. Mabuya to come in a bit on that. The agricultural sector contributes about 17% uh, uh, to, to the national GDP. Um, but having said that, we, we, we heard that uh, uh, 60 to 70% uh, of, the, of the livelihoods in Zimbabwe are dependent on, on agriculture uh, in one way or the other, directly or, or indirectly. That's a huge chunk. That's any important uh, contribution uh, to the generality of the people that are living in Zimbabwe. That's why people say uh, the, 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 country is in ag the country's economy is an agro-based uh, economy. It comes from that. Industry, um, what, you, what you see as raw materials that go into uh, different industries, 60% uh, of the raw materials, uh, uh, one way or the other, are uh, coming from, uh, from agriculture. Thank you very much, Doc. I hope our list, our participant has been uh, answered. And that was Veronica Makuvaru, who had sent through a question. Thank you very much for that. We are inviting more questions for us to interact with you and answer to your questions and your requests. Another question that came through is asking, what kind or type of bag is suitable for natural drying of grain? Just to start that off, it's important for you to take note of the fact that drying is faster in the open air if you're going to be using natural methods. If you're going to put your grain in a bag, then it is also going to, re to increase the time frame that you require for that grain to reach the desired moisture content. However, it's important for you to take note of the fact that there are some different types of bags that are recommended, inclusive of which are the polypropylene bags that you can get either from GMB or reputable suppliers. Maybe Dr. Mabuya, you can come in there with additional comments on the bags that can be used. Generally, it's the, the, the type of bags that will allow uh, free, free circulation of air so that we don't encourage the buildup of humidity. We don't encourage uh, temperature buildup. We don't encourage conditions uh, that favor uh, insects uh, to multiply. And uh, these are um, the, the haze and bags, because you still want air to move in uh, freely. Uh, you still want to lose your, um, your, your, your moisture. So your, your ordinary haze and bags uh, will be quite handy in that respect. Thank you very much, Doc, for that contribution. Another question that came through, is of a farmer who is asking, how do you then know that the moisture content has reached the level that you want? The, the best way for you to do that is not through visual assessment. Rather, it is advisable for you to take samples of your grain to your nearest GMB for testing of the moisture content before you start harvesting. Least you harvest your crop too early and you are going to be returned from the point of sale. So it's important for you to take samples of the grain for inspection first at GMB to check on the moisture content if it has reached the desired moisture content or if it is too still too high for you to make an informed decision rather than you making a visual assessment as this may be misleading and give you false results. Dr. Mapia, you can add on that. Okay. 
once your crop has reached the physiological maturity, what it means from then on, what you are going to lose uh, is moisture. Uh, of course, um, you can't be going to um, to 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 the GMB uh, maybe with something that is around thirty. Uh, what you need to do is as a preliminary sort of kind of uh, indicator. Your physiological maturity has arrived. You have lost some bit of moisture. Um, your grain now is getting stiff. So what you need to do um, sometimes is to try and take some grains. Uh, you try to crush them with your teeth. You, you see the difficulty that you will face there. Sometimes it's, it's, it's a smooth, uh, no sound comes out. And sometimes a sharp sound comes out. Once that happens, then you need to take your sample now to the GMB and they will they now confirm whether it's now at 13, it's 14. Then depending on the weather conditions that are prevailing during that period, um, you need to know when next you will bring it until they say it's now fine, you can bring the crop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc, for that. The other question that we are getting is much generated interest on the metal silos, which is to say our farmers are becoming techno savvy and it's a good thing. The farmer is asking on where they can purchase these metal silos. The advice that we can give you is for you to contact your nearest agritex officers. They will lead you to the appropriate people who will give you the information on where you can get reputable, durable metal silos. The other way you can do it is also to engage the ministry uh, of, uh, through the mechanization department because this is their specialty and they can give you the best advice on where you can get such facilities. Please send through your questions as our presentation is left with six minutes before we tail off. The other question that has come through is on whether or not seed co varieties are bred to resist insect attack? An interesting question indeed. I'll take it in part, then I'll hand it over to the doctor for a detailed explanation. Firstly, the thing that makes your, your grain more susceptible to insect damage, like Dr. Mawiaye has alluded to, is the fact that you leave the grain in the field for too long and it becomes too dry, making it susceptible to insect damage. So once grain is dry, there's no need for it to become shriveled and too dry in the field as this increases the incidence of the weevil damage that you are going to incur. This is my contribution and I'll hand you over to Dr. Maguyaye for his contribution on that question. Okay. Naturally, what makes the uh, grain susceptible to, to weevling has a bearing on moisture. Uh, once a, a crop, uh, has reached the physiological maturity, it has started uh, losing moisture. Uh, around 20%, you start to get uh, weevil damage. Uh, and this has a bearing on the relative maturity that we alluded to earlier on. If, say, a farmer has planted an early maturing variety and a late maturing variety uh, on the same farm, Naturally, you would find that the early maturing varieties will uh, reach maturity early, and that's the only food that is around for whatever insects uh, that may be uh, wanting to attack, be it weevils, uh, be it whatever. So farmers have to make sure that uh, agronomically they are aware that early maturing varieties also have to be taken out uh, early. You need to make sure that you are on the watch out. You can't take out early maturing varieties same time as late maturing varieties uh, because a lot would have happened there. But what we have tended to do now is to make sure that uh, we don't get uh, weevils attacking our crops early. Uh, we are bringing in what we call climate smart varieties. Uh, these varieties, uh, they are resilient to many eventualities that come with the uh, climate change. 
the build up of weevils has a bearing on the temperatures that are around uh, the cycle of weevil development is shortened because the temperatures are getting higher and higher so what we've tended to do is to uh, build in our varieties uh, some of the things uh, that will make sure that uh, the weevils don't easily uh, attack. Uh, this includes uh, uh, hard gray, it includes uh, tip cover, uh, but however, uh, let me hasten to say that uh, no grain can be said to be completely uh, resistant to uh, weevil attack. It is only a relative uh, term. So farmers need to make sure that in terms of uh, sanitation, they are spot on, uh, in terms of uh, removing the crop from the field as and when it's ready, they are spot on, so that we minimize uh, these losses that contribute to uh, the 40% uh, that we talked about uh, earlier on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc. Thank you very much to all our participants. We are seeing your contributions. We are seeing your comments of our presentation for future improvements and future ed edifying our presentations to make them more valuable for you. We are also seeing your contributions in terms of the need for you to, 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 to work with us in further developing ways and finding out how we can improve harvesting and post-harvest handling. We thank you so much for participating in this webinar. We invite further questions, if they too arise, for you to send them through to our email address, agronomy.com. Thank you very much for joining us and also visit our website for more information. Download our SIDCO app for further information and calculations, testimonials, and different other benefits that you can get from that particular application. Remember, SIDCO is the home of bumper harvest and farming is a business. It starts with the right seed, coupled with good agronomic practices, which include good post-harvest handling techniques. At this point, I'd like to thank Dr. Mabuyaye for joining us and invite his last or parting shot. Uh, thank you to our viewers. Uh, uh, let's make sure that we all involved, we all take care of the grain. Uh, that we have. Uh, the 40% that we talked about uh, is too high a figure. We need to work towards reducing it to very minimal levels so that we make sure that our productivity is at, high, at the highest levels possible. Thank you.